All right. Hello. My name is Megan Huff. Oops. And today I'm going to talk about Marguerite McLaughlin, but I'm going to give a few minutes for folks to tune in. Um, and while I'm doing that, I would like to share with you all um, what we're going to be doing tomorrow, which is a really exciting thing. Tomorrow is Junior Ranger Day. It is National Junior Ranger Day, so it is a Junior Ranger Day for all the national parks nationwide. Um, and what we have put together, what our rangers have put together, are some really fun things for you to do at home, activities to do at home. And, um, and then tomorrow at 3 p.m. here on Facebook Live, we're going to have a, um, a virtual Junior Ranger swearing-in ceremony. Um, so, in the comments, I'm going to put a link to where you learn more about Junior Ranger Day and the Junior Ranger Day activities and how to become a Junior Ranger tomorrow. All right, so on that web page, you can find everything you need to know and all the, the fun new activities that our park rangers have put together. All right. There we go. All right, so as I mentioned, today I'm going to be talking about Marguerite McLaughlin. Um, and I thought I would sort of share the top five things that I think are cool about her, <laughs> that you should know about her. Um, Marguerite was the wife of Fort Vancouver's chief factor, Dr. John McLaughlin, um, but she's also someone who was very interesting in her own right. Um, and before we get too far, in the comments, or sorry, in the description of the video, I mentioned the captions will be added to the video after the live broadcast ends. So just check back later um, today for the captioned version of this video. If you know a review or if anyone you know prefers to watch um, with captions. So I am also going to put a photo of Marguerite in the comments here. So give me one second while I do that. Hmm. Maybe I can do that. Well, I might not be able to do that. I'm learning a lot about Facebook Live. <laughs> so anyway, there is a photo um, on our Facebook page right now of what she looked like. Um, we have in our collection the only known photograph of Marguerite. Um, and I'll share a link later that will show you that. So after the program, you can go look at it. Um, it is a daguerreotype, which is an early form of photograph. And it's the only, as I said, it's the only known image of Marguerite. And it does show her in her later life. Um, unfortunately, we don't know what she looked like as a young woman. Um, and we don't know a ton about Marguerite in general. Um, unfortunately, she wasn't someone a lot of people wrote about um, and she wasn't able to write her own story and this is something that a lot of women from this time period especially um, the wives of fur traders who are often native or metis or first nations have in common um, but what we are able to do is sort of find these little bits of information about her from a variety of sources from census documents or the writings of people who encountered her or by tracking her husbands as they moved through their careers um, and just sort of stitch together those little details to make as complete a picture as we can of what she was like. So I don't want to give you any wild conjecture here, but I am going to share sort of my, some of my impressions on what she might have been like based on that research. Um, so my thing to know about Marguerite, number one, is that um, like many others at the time, Marguerite was born a child of the fur trade. 
Her mother was an Ojibwe woman, um, probably living in the Great Lakes area, and we do not know what her name was. Her father was Jean Etienne Waden, who was born in Switzerland and came to Canada as a soldier with the French army during the Seven Years' War, or as it's commonly called in the United States, the French and Indian War. Uh, Marguerite's parents uh, may have had what's called a country marriage or a fur trade marriage, um, or in French, which a lot of the fur traders spoke, a mariage à la façon du pays, um, marriage in the fashion of the country, um, which is a marriage-like agreement um, that was sometimes done with some sort of ceremony or an exchange of gifts, um, but it was not something that you needed to have a government or a church for, because these are things that were in short supply um, out in Canada at that time where the fur traders were active. Um, and Marguerite, so that was her parents, and then Marguerite was born around 1775. All right, thing to know about Marguerite number two. Um, Marguerite experienced a lot of hardships and challenges in her life. And I think when we talk about historical people, it's good to sort of think about what the challenges they faced were, because especially at the moment, a lot of us are facing a lot of challenges and, um, and learning about the challenges that they faced kind of gives us a window into what their lives were like. Um, so when Marguerite was seven years old, uh, her father was murdered by a rival fur trader. And we don't know what happened to Marguerite and her mother at that time, um, if they went back to her mother's family or if uh, Marguerite's mother was able to make a fur trade and marriage with another man. Um, but by the time she was 35 years old, uh, Marguerite had a country marriage husband of her own, a fur trader named Alexander Mackay, and four children, three daughters and a son. And in 1810, Alexander Mackay joined John Jacob Astor's Pacific Fur Company, and he took their 13-year-old son Thomas with him on a sea voyage to the Pacific Northwest, and their mission was to establish Fort Astoria, where Astoria, Oregon is today. Uh, Marguerite was left behind alone at the Northwest Company's Fort William in Canada in the Great Lakes uh, with their three daughters. And the next year, Alexander was killed. And it was around that time that Marguerite met and began her relationship with John McLaughlin while she was at Fort William. So at that time, Fort William is a Northwest Company fort. If you're familiar with the history of Fort Vancouver, you have probably heard of the Hudson's Bay Company. Um, but at that time, um, before 1821, there were two, there were these two big fur trading companies and some other ones as well. Um, but there was the Hudson's Bay Company and the Northwest Company, and they did not get along very well. Um, but then in 1821, they merged. So we're talking about 1811. So it's all Northwest Company at that time. That's who John McLaughlin was working for. Um, so at that time, the Northwest Company did not like having single or unattached women around their forts. Um, they thought that that would cause problems. Um, and the Northwest Company did have an interest in making sure that the wives of company employees were taken care of in to some degree if the person that they were married to left the fur trade or died or something like that. Um, John McLaughlin at that time was working at Fort William as a clerk and physician, and he had had his own country marriage or relationship of some nature before he met Marguerite. Um, and he had been with a, a native or First Nations woman uh, who had died in childbirth with his son, Joseph. So Marguerite was at Fort William, single with these three girls, and John McLaughlin was a single man with a baby. And it probably made a lot of sense for them to form a relationship and provide each other help and stability at that time. But over the years, uh, Marguerite spent a lot of time raising the children on her own. John traveled around Canada and Europe for work, um, and Marguerite was left with the, her three daughters, Joseph McLaughlin, and the four additional children she had with John McLaughlin. And in the 1820s, um, or sorry, <laughs> in the 1820s, uh, John McLaughlin was assigned with establishing Fort Vancouver 
uh, for the Hudson's Bay Company. So this is after that merger between the Northwest Company and the Hudson's Bay Company. Um, and before they left Fort William, the three McKay girls had, or Mackay girls, had already reached a marriageable age. They were ready to leave home. Um, but of the four McLaughlin children, two were left behind in Quebec. Uh, Marguerite and John's son, John Jr., was around eight years old at the time, and he was sent to Montreal, where his uncles were going to oversee his education. And their six-year-old daughter, Elizabeth, was sent to a Catholic school in Montreal. And the two youngest children, Eloisa and David, came with the McLaughlins to Fort Vancouver. Now, as far as I can tell, McLaughlin never saw her four eldest daughters in person again. Marguerite was eventually reunited with her sons, Thomas and John Jr., um, although in 1842, John Jr. was also the victim of a murder, um, maybe for another Facebook Live event, we can talk about that. Um, but John McLaughlin, Dr. John McLaughlin, did end up seeing the girls again. And they, the McLaughlins actually sent money to one of them over the years to help support them. Um, and I think it's sort of interesting that her husband was able to see the girls again, but Marguerite was probably not ever able to see them in person again. And it sort of speaks to, um, in that time in the 19th century, a woman was really meant to stay in the home and men had much more freedom to travel around the country, around the world. Um, and that's how John, Dr. John McLaughlin was able to see the girls because of his ability to travel while Marguerite was staying at home. All right, so thing to know number three, um, despite all those challenges in her life, Marguerite is someone who I think you can tell by looking at the historic record uh, was very loved. Uh, John McLaughlin was extremely devoted to her and he would not tolerate anyone speaking badly of her or disrespecting her. Um, there are also little details in the historic record that reflect the kind of relationships she had with her children. Um, in 1841, her daughter Eloisa gave birth while traveling from Alaska to California. Um, Eloisa actually gave birth aboard um, a steamship called the Beaver, uh, which was traveling by water from Alaska to um, down to Fort Vancouver and then on to California. Um, and Eloisa ended up staying at Fort Vancouver with her new baby for about a year while her husband went on to California. And to me, that detail reminds me of the way that um, new mothers today and in history um, all over the world might rely on advice and support from elder women or experienced mothers and their families or circle of friends. Um, and that seems to have been the case for Marguerite and her daughter as well. Marguerite also appears a lot in the Catholic church records at Fort Vancouver as a godmother to her own grandchildren um, and many others, that uh, children who were born um, at the fort or out in the village, which is to the west or to the east of, to the west of the fort. Um, some of the women who lived in the village also reported that Marguerite taught them to cook. Uh, Marguerite was also a skill, skilled beater and a needle worker, and she would also teach others those skills. Checking the comments. All right. In case you have any questions, just put them in the in the comments, and I'll take a look. So, the thing to know about Marguerite number four: um, Marguerite was known for being a calming, balancing influence in the Chief Factors House at Fort Vancouver, um, especially with her husband John, who is known for his hot temper. Um, but there's also evidence that she had her own strong personality and that they together were kind of a force to be reckoned with. Um, there are anecdotes in the historical record about her riding a horse gentleman fashion um, rather than side saddle, which surprised the American missionaries' wives who visited the fort. Um, she apparently never learned English, uh, despite living in a very English-speaking world, especially later in her life. Um, but she probably spoke to her family and friends in French um, and or Ojibwe. In the 1830s, a Church of England minister was assigned to Fort Vancouver. His name was Herbert Beaver, and he was a pretty unpleasant character. Um, he
he insisted, one of the things that he did, among other things, was that he insisted that the children of the fort and the Hudson's Bay Company village to the west of the fort attend his school. It, it was really important to him that um, he was in control of the education of children at Fort Vancouver. Um, the McLaughlins really, really disliked <laughs> Reverend Beaver. Um, and it wasn't so much a religious disagreement because the McLaughlins were, um, were religious as well. Um, it was a personality clash, I think is the, the nice way to put it. Um, for example, with the school, um, Herbert Beaver wanted the school to be done according to the Church of England doctrine. But McLaughlin was very sensitive to the fact that um, the employees of the fort were also, many of them were French Canadian and they were Catholic. So he wanted the curriculum to be a little more general so that they would not feel uncomfortable. And that was not something that Beaver was willing to accommodate. Um, so anyway, he had this very important Herbert Beaver's school at Fort Vancouver. Um, and there was one occasion where um, Marguerite told some of the children in the fort who were um, at the chief actor's house that they, well, they didn't want to go to the school and she told them that, that would be fine. They could just stay there and help her with some projects or whatever needed to be done. And this infuriated <laughs> Herbert Beaver and he wrote some very strongly worded letters against Marguerite. Um, and Beaver had this sort of disdain for Marguerite and the fact that at the time the McLaughlin's uh, marriage had not been done through a church. And Beaver's perspective was that um, if these country marriages were not real marriages, basically. Um, so Marguerite and their marriage together was a factor in the clash between John McLaughlin and Beaver. Um, however, John and Marguerite did get, end up getting married through the Catholic Church in 1842. All right, um, maybe I'll answer the questions at the end, but please put them in the comment section and I will get to that. Um, so my fifth thing to know about Marguerite, my last thing to mention is that you can visit three places, well, not right now, but when things are open again, um, you can visit three places where Marguerite lived, um, Fort William, which is a historical site in Canada, or a historical park, I will put that in the comments. Or the link, rather, to their website in case you want to see what that looks like. Um, so that was sort of her early life, her marriage to John McLaughlin, her, um, the end of her relationship with Alexander Mackay. Um, and of course, you can also visit Fort Vancouver, um, where she would have lived in the Chief Factor's house. Um, and then the last place that Marguerite lived with her husband and her family was the McLaughlin House in Oregon City, which is a unit of Fort Vancouver National Historic Site. Um, John McLaughlin retired from the Hudson's Bay Company in early 1846, and that's when they moved into the home down in Oregon City uh, with Marguerite. Uh, they lived in the house with their daughter, Eloisa, their son-in-law, Daniel Harvey, and their six grandchildren. That is a four bedroom house with all those people in it um, at various times coming and going. Um, we have a number of things that were owned by Marguerite in our museum collection, um, including a Japanese lacquer sewing cabinet that was gifted to her by a clerk at Fort Vancouver um, and Marguerite sewing tools. So I'm going to add a couple links in the comments um, to some articles on our website where you can learn more about Marguerite's sewing tools in our collection and one link where you can read more about Marguerite's life. So let me put those in there and then I will see um, what questions you all have. All right, so one question from Justine. Hi, Justine. Is, um, are there any surviving beading or needleworks that we know were made by the McLaughlins? And none by Marguerite, but we do have a beaded lion um, that was 
done by Marguerite's granddaughter, Louisa. And that's pretty much it. There was, um, nope, that's pretty much it <laughs> that we have. But we have a lot of, in our museum collection, a lot of Marguerite's sewing tools. So that kind of gives us an idea of the work she was doing. And you can take a look at that link to, to see photos of all of them and, and kind of learn what they were and all of that. Let's see, a question from Michelle. What would be the timeline of living at Fort Vancouver and then the McLaughlin House in Oregon City? So they were living at Fort Vancouver starting in 1824 um, and then up to 1846. Um, the history of Fort Vancouver is a little interesting. It was originally built up on a bluff to the east of where you see the reconstructed fort today. So um, it's where the Washington State School for the Deaf is now located, if you're familiar with Vancouver. Um, so that fort stood there and from 1824 to eight, winter of 1824 to 25 to 1829. And then they tore that fort down and then rebuilt on the plain where the reconstruction is located today. So the chief factor's house, well, and so they lived in, a, <laughs> and there's another change too. So the original fort that they built on that plain was sort of a square shape. And then later they expanded it to a rectangle shape, um, which is what we've recreated. So the, the chief factor's house that we have reconstructed at Fort Vancouver National Historic Site that you can walk through, that is a, a recreation of a house that was there beginning in 1838. So that's a lot of dates, but basically they were living at Fort Vancouver, whatever that meant at the time, from 1824-25 to 1846. Then they moved to Oregon City from 1846 John McLaughlin died in 1857. Marguerite died in 1860. Um, and then the family, the remaining family, eventually moved to Portland. All right. And that kind of wraps it up for me today. Um, we will uh, hopefully we'll do this again. And uh, check out the links in the comments to learn more about Junior Ranger Day tomorrow and more about Marguerite McLaughlin. Uh, so, Thank you all so much for joining me today. Bye.